stuff to really learn because there are things that a minister is going to go through that's not in a book. Yes, sir. Amen. So we can learn by uh, being up on a minister and see how he handles certain situations. Uh, his topic is the redemptive price of redemption. The redemptive price of redemption. Ephesians 1 and 7. So after another song, the next uh, voice you hear will be a brother Joseph Caesar. Page number 780. Want to be wonderful there. When with the Savior will enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? Ended the troubles and cares of the story land. Won't it be wonderful there? We know that won't it be wonderful there? When we have no burdens to bear, we'll all be joyously singing when heart bells are ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Walking and talking with Christ the supernal one Won't it be wonderful there Praising, adoring the matchless eternal one Won't it be wonderful there We know that won't it be wonderful there When we are having no burdens to We'll all be joyously singing when heart bells are ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful there? And there where the tempest will never be sweeping us. Won't it be wonderful there? Sure that forever the Lord will be keeping us. Won't it be wonderful there? We know that won't it be wonderful there? When we are having no burdens to bear, we will be joyous when we are five extra minutes to extend the invitation. You're going to be the last speaker, okay? Good to be in Dallas, Texas today. Amen. I want to thank Brother Clay and the committee for inviting me and having me uh, this morning. I want to thank those who have led the way. Um, second time I've been able to preach alongside Brother Bradley and I appreciate uh, our older seasoned brothers. We younger brothers can learn a lot from them. So we're thankful for those who have paved the way for the, us younger generation that we can come up behind you and maintain that sound doctrine that has been set in place from the first century church from the apostles who laid things down so that we would have a foundation by which we can build up a church Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 16 for though I preach the gospel I have nothing to glory of he said for necessity is laid upon me Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. The problem that we have in the brotherhood is not just unsound doctrine. The problem is bigger than that. Even among the sound brothers, sometimes we forget how we became who we are. You know, it's, I'm not afraid to preach the cross. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, it is the power of God 
unto salvation to all who believe it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. But he didn't stop there in verse number 17. He says, for therein, inside of the gospel, is found the righteousness of God. I've been given the topic, the redemptive price of redemption. I believe Brother Clay knew my background, and he knew what was going to happen despite the topic that he gave me. So he gave me a topic that was going to go right in line with where I was going to go anyway. The redemptive price of redemption. The reason why brothers are out there acting a fool is because they forgot the price by which was paid for their salvation. We get confused into thinking that this is our church and it doesn't belong to us. It doesn't matter what comes out of your mouth. What comes out of your mouth is irrelevant. It's how you behave in the body of Christ. I remember in the days of old, in Numbers chapter 21, where the children of Israel were getting bit by serpents and they were dying because of their disobedience. Then the Bible says that God commanded that he take a bronze serpent and that he take a pole and that he lift up the bronze serpent on top of the pole. And then when the children of Israel looked upon the pole, that the bites that would result in death would cease. There was a price that had to be paid. There was a serpent that represents death. And in the New Testament, Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse number 32, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He didn't say if I had a song group that you can draw folk unto me. He didn't say if I had a cold preacher that I would draw men unto me. He didn't say any of that. He said if you put me on that pole and you give us an eyewitness account of what happened on the cross then I will draw men unto me. One of the things that I realize is that if you attract folk with all that sugar then you're going to have to maintain the sugar to keep them there. But as soon as you start preaching the cross they're going to scatter like flies. John chapter 3 verse number 14. Jesus said as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so must the son of man be lifted up. Brothers we need to lift up that serpent. You say Jesus is not a serpent. I tell you what. When he took up your sin and mine. He became death so that we might have life. The Bible says that even in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 18 that his feet look like brass. Just like that brazen serpent in Numbers 21. That's my introduction, folks. I love to preach the gospel. And you know what? I'm not afraid to do it. That was one of the reasons why I put that on the paper. I had two good teachers who were not afraid to preach the truth. If your teachers are afraid to preach the truth, the students are going to be afraid to preach the truth. In Romans chapter 6, in verse number 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible lets us know that all of us were condemned at some point. But there was a gift that was to be had. In Romans chapter 5 and verse number 8. But God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. That was the price. You know we can go home right now. 
That was the price. His death. But the thing is, Jesus just didn't die. Well, what's up? You know, if uh, your son was brutally murdered, you know, we were real sensitive today about what's going on with the law enforcement. Cops are killing our young folk just for pulling out their driver's license. And it's all over Facebook and YouTube about how cops are crooked and they're taking our lives for no reason. And then they tell you that the young man got shot six times and that his girlfriend was in the passenger seat and that his young boy was in the back seat and that the car was white and that he wasn't speeding. We know that he had a concealed handgun license. We know all the details of Philando Castile. But when it comes to our Savior, we act like we can just say that he died and then walk away and, and pretend like we told the story. In John chapter 19 and verse number 1, the Bible says that they took a scourge and they whipped our Savior in his back. You know, folk, like we, sometimes we wait till the end of the sermon and tell the gospel. I believe the gospel should be interwoven yes, sir. Into, into the sermon. Yes, sir. The Bible says that he was scourged. Well, the Bible says that they sped upon him. Right. The Bible says that they put a, a, a scarlet robe around his back and put a reed in his hand. They were mocking him. Yes. They took the reed out of his hands and they, they hit him upside the head. And the reed is dried up grass. Have you ever been hit upside the head with dried up grass? while you have a crown of thorns on your head then the bible says that they, they, they bound him to a piece of wood and they marched him outside of the camp where the sacrifices were made to a place called Golgotha the bible says that the sacrifice carried his own wood I, I remember in Genesis I remember when Abraham was commanded to bring his son up on the mountain to be a sacrifice. And I remember how he told his son, he said, I want you to carry the wood. He didn't know what the wood was for, but Jesus did. Can you imagine carrying your own cross? Knowing what's about to happen, knowing about the nails that are about to be driven into your hands, knowing about the nails that are going to be driven into your feet while folk all around you laughing. Can you imagine being lifted up, dropped into a hole like a pin doll attached to a piece of wood? Can you imagine your mother looking at you? And we like to use the Catholic pictures of, of, of Jesus with a couple of drops of blood here and a couple of drops of blood there and it's a garment sewn. But the Bible says they stripped him of his clothes. He was in front of his mother naked. And the Bible says that they offered him vinegar mixed with gall, a disgusting drink. And he still said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then the father who gave his son, watching his son die, hears his son cry out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Can you imagine your son hanging on a pole and crying out to you? And you not doing a thing? That was the redemptive price for your redemption. Don't ever forget that. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. That story is not the end of it. That story. Yes, the death, the burial, and the resurrection redeemed you. But what did he make you? And I believe that's why our brothers got it wrong. Before you get employed, Brother Funder, Brother Funder made sure I was going to preach the cross today. 
Before you get employed and you accept a job, make sure you understand what the job description is. Don't be so adamant about getting that big paycheck without understanding the job description for which you are applying. Our brothers in the brotherhood, they use fancy words. They use real fancy words. And, I, and, and brothers, I, I'm being serious about this. The brothers who have strayed away, they know who they are. They're watching. The brothers who have strayed away, it's no funny matter. And I want you all to know that we have to mourn these brothers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse number one, he says, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. There was a brother who was in sin. There was a brother who had been confused and he wasn't keeping himself. And the Bible says, in such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And I'm not accusing our brothers of, of such a heinous sin, but the thing is, God sees all sin the same. In Romans chapter 3 and 23, he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I, I, I'm not putting one sin above another. In God's eyes, a homosexual is the same as a drunkard and a liar. Yes, sir. So if you teach false doctrine and you perpetuate a false doctrine that is divisive in the brotherhood, that is just as sinful as a homosexual or a man who sleeps with his father's wife. But the Bible says, and you are puffed up. He's talking to the church now. You are puffed up and have not rather mourned. These brothers need to be, we mourn for you brothers. It hurts us. It hurts my soul to the deepest depths. Why? Because we should have fellowship in Christ. We're stronger together than we are apart. We got brothers that are sound brothers that are fighting and warring. Come together, brothers. Come together. I don't want to have to answer for that. Blessed are the peacemakers. Make peace in the brotherhood. But our brothers, they, they, they got fancy. We got educations. I, the education I have, it was a good one. But I counted all this dumb. Because if I get all the education and lose my soul, what good was it? But they use fancy words now in the pulpits. They use words like allegory, metonymy, pericope, synecdoche. But the thing is, I'm not worried about any of that. What I'm worried about, Brother Thunder, is depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. Those are the ease that I'm worried about. They know more about icy Jesus and exit Jesus than they know about the blood of Jesus. I ain't scared of y'all. Now I'm going to get on my list. Ephesians chapter 1. I was assigned verse number 7. I was assigned verse number 7, but I like reading the whole paragraph because you get the, the full picture. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3, we're going to read down to about verse number 12. The Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us. I like that word. He hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. We're going to come back to that word, holy and without blame. Brother Harper was my teacher. I just want you to know that. Having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. What was the mystery, Paul? According to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Then he lays out what the mystery is. 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in a one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Now the brother gave me 10 minutes, like I said, Brother Harper, he would just look at it and flip it. So, Brother Craig, help me, brother. That's what I heard yesterday. Help me, brother. But if you go back to verse number 4, the Bible says, According as he had chosen us in him from the foundation of the world. You know, I'm not afraid of that verse. Yes, we are chosen from the foundation of the world. How do we know that? In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that there was a predetermined plan that from the foundation of the earth, before the earth even began, that Jesus would come and hang on the cross and die for you and I. That was set in motion before there was even such a man named Adam. But I like the back part of that. He says that we should be holy. Let's talk about that word holy. In Leviticus chapter 10 and verse 10, the, the Aaronic priesthood, they were called holy. Am I going to have a reader? I know we, I just need a reader. We need a little bit of help, brothers. And that you may put difference between holy between holy and unholy so there is a difference between that which is holy and unholy between unclean between unclean and clean and clean see the thing is yes there is a difference between that which is holy and unholy and clean and unclean but in the new testament we are called to be holy in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 15, the Bible says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation or in our language behavior. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So how did they get that way in the Old Testament? Because I believe we can learn something. There is something called a foreshadowing. That's not a fancy word. We know what a shadow is. If there is something that is tall and there's sun beaming from the back end of it, it's going to cast a shadow. And if I'm walking in the direction of the real thing, the shadow is a forthcoming of what is to come, the real thing. So I believe that the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, was a foreshadowing of a new priesthood. So the Bible says in Exodus chapter 29 and verse number 4, I want to be mindful, I'm going to be mindful of time, I'm going to try to be. They told me I have five extra minutes. That's what they told me. Brothers got to keep their word. In Exodus chapter 29 in the verses 4, the Bible says, And Aaron and his sons, thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and shalt wash them with water. In order for them to be holy or set apart or sanctified or redeemed, they had to first be washed with water. Later on in that same chapter, in verse number five, the Bible says, And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod. And thou shalt put upon the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. What I see is that they had to be dressed differently. They were giving a new garment to wear. When you look later on in verse number seven, he says, then thou shalt take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. And thou shalt bring his sons and put coats on them too. And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his sons, and put the bonnets on them. And a priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statue. And thou shalt consecrate or set apart Aaron and his sons. They had to be anointed with oil, which in the Old Testament, that was symbolism for the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to switch over to Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus chapter 8 and verse number 12, this oil, when it was poured in chapter 29 of Exodus, it was described as consecrating Aaron and his sons. But in Leviticus chapter 8 and verse 12, and he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. 
staying in the same chapter, Leviticus chapter 8 and verse number 14. And he brought the bullock of the sin offering or for the sin offering. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of the bullock for a sin offering. And he slew it and Moses took the blood and put it upon the horns of the, of the altar round about with his finger and purified the altar. And poured the blood at the bottom of the altar and sanctified it. Why? To make a correct reconciliation upon it. The altar was covered with blood. The altar of reconciliation. We have an altar. I'll get there in a minute. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse number 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. The life is in the blood and the blood is on the altar for an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. I'm going somewhere. I want you all to stay with me. And then in Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29. In verse number 19. For the second time I'm just going to give you the cliff note version. They took a ram and they, they slew the ram and they took the blood and they put it on the right lobe of, of Aaron's ear and on his right finger and, and on his toe. Blood had to touch him to sanctify him. What does it have to do with us? We're a priesthood today. In 1 Peter chapter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2. In verse number 5. Brother DC, you're going you to help me out. 1 Peter chapter 2. In verse number 5. 1 Peter 2, 5, and ye also. And ye also. As, as lively, stones lively stones. Are built up a spiritual house. Are built up a spiritual house. A, and holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. Holy, separate, set apart. Keep reading. To offer up spiritual sacrifices. Brothers and sisters, this is our purpose. To offer up spiritual sacrifices, not any sacrifices, but what kind? Acceptable. Acceptable. To God. By to God Jesus Christ. There's only one people that are authorized to offer up sacrifices to God and have them be acceptable. And those people that are authorized of those who have been washed, you know, in order for us to be set apart and holy, we have to be washed with water, too. I remember I remember the Ethiopian eunuch. I remember he was in the middle of the desert with Philip, the preacher. And I remember he said, there's water. What hindereth me from being baptized? I remember in Acts chapter two. In verse number 38, after the command was to repent and be baptized, they were anointed with oil. Not the oil, not literal oil, spiritual oil. We have the gift, the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the gift of the Holy Spirit? Eternal life. Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal eternal life. The Bible lets us know clearly that we have to be washed in water. That we have to be anointed with the Holy Spirit. But we have to also have the blood touch our bodies. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 5 the Bible says and from Jesus Christ who is our faithful witness, the first begotten from the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him who loved, loved us, us and, and washed us from our sins. From our sins. Where? In his own In blood. His own blood you know when you touch that water you also touch that blood we have an altar in the new testament in hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 10 the bible says we have an altar whereof they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought unto the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp wherefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate the altar is the cross where the sacrifice was laid and attached and his blood from his back and his blood from his hands and his blood from his side and his blood from his head and his blood from his his feet sanctified the altar of reconciliation that reconciles sinful man with a perfect God I believe y'all get it. Washed in water. Washed in blood. Holy Spirit. Altar. Blood. 
And now let's talk about the job description. I'm, I'm closing. He's, he's, he's walking up. He's going to get me. Brothers, no sacrifice is acceptable to God except the sacrifices from his priesthood. No drums. No clapping. Those were not the calves of your lips as described in the book of Habakkuk. There is and, 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 and I'm, I'm trying to educate us as well. When you put in your CD player, Mary Mary, Donna McClurkin, bass miking, and you put that in your CD player, they are not authorized to praise God on your behalf. Can anyone show me in the Old Testament or the New Testament where people from God hired and paid money so that the heathen could sing to their God. Well, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not milling. I'm telling the truth. But I, I, I want you to know also that if you are not a member of this body, you are not authorized, regardless if you believe you are praising God or not. You are not authorized to praise God, therefore, he doesn't hear you. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, John chapter 9, and verse number 31. But you can change that today. How do you do that? You hear the gospel. That story that I just shared with you, the, the bloody death, the burial, and the resurrection. You hear that. You believe it with all your heart. You repent of your sins, according to Luke 13, 3, and Acts chapter 2, and verse number 38. And then you confess the sweetest name that you confess I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 37. Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 32. And then you are baptized for the remission of your sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38. Romans chapter 6, 3 through 7. Galatians chapter, the, the scriptures go on and on. Then we, he will sanctify you. He will redeem you. He will cleanse you, atone you, and sanctify you. As he puts you into his body, the church. If you're subject to the Savior's invitation, we're going to ask that you come forward as we stand and sing the song of invitation.